Thank you, Betsy. And thank you, Abby. And I'm just so honored to be here. And I'm really excited about the exhibition. Um, some of my favorite artists are in it. And so I wish I could be in New York and I wish things were for many reasons, um, non-COVID right now. But um, I just wanna say to everybody, if you haven't checked out the exhibition, make sure to either in person, if you have that opportunity, um, or online. And I just really do want to give a shout out to everyone who's made this happen. But Betsy, you made a beautiful selection. So thanks everybody for tuning in on a Saturday. I know um, that some people are writing in where they're calling in from. And definitely if you do know whose ancestral land you're on, or if you do know whose land you are on now, I'd encourage everyone to type that in. Um, a lot of the talks that I give I always like to share the links where you can actually find that out because not everybody knows that. And it's important to know whose land you're occupying. So I'm gonna type these in here. And on top of it, there's actually a number that you can text um, to find out where you're at. Great. Um, so I am actually calling in from Tongva land. I'm here in Los Angeles in the neighborhood of Mid City. And as Betsy mentioned, I live part of the month on the res where I'm from under normal circumstances. I stay with my dad there. I grew up in Tuba City, Arizona, which is on the western side of the reservation. And I'll definitely touch on that and talk more about that here in a bit. Um, but I have a slideshow to share with you all. So I'm gonna share my screen. And I do apologize in advance if you hear some shouting dogs in the background. I will do my best to keep them quiet. They've had their CBD treats earlier, but um, apologies if that happens. So let's see. Okay, great. So I'm gonna turn off my video here. Um, mm -mm -mm. All right. One moment, let me see. I'm not like the world's greatest millennial, so thanks for your patience. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna um, start out by introducing myself in Navajo as per custom. She'e ama Robbins, Yanishia, Bilagana Nishle, Hushkan Hadzoche Bashes Chin, Bilagana Dashiche, Adona Kaidene Dashinale, Akut Ego Stana Nishle, Ado. Um, Navajo Water Project, do the chapter house, ha, the chapter house, do um, and as I mentioned, I'm from Tuba City, Arizona, on the Navajo Nation. And uh, again, you know, I'm an artist, I'm an activist, and I'm a community organizer. And I work for the Navajo Water Project as the director, where I've been for five years. Um, and as Bet Betsy mentioned, I am the founder of the chapter house. I'll talk about all of those things. Um, just sort of mashed up together and really focus on how all of these things sort of inform each other um, and starting, you know, with some previous work of my art and then kind of talking about what I'm working on today. So like many of us on this call, you know, I grew up in very different worlds. And as I got older, I started to realize that these all sort of informed each other. Um, despite the fact that they were so different. So my mom's family is Jewish and they're from the south side of Chicago. And my dad is Diné, and I grew up on the reservation as mentioned. But during the summers, I would go and visit my grandparents um, in Evanston, which is a suburb of Chicago. And I also just, it's really important to me to talk about that because I grew up sort of with one foot on the res and one foot off the res, and it really was a place of privilege. And it helped me see a lot of different things, but specifically injustices, right? So why were 30% uh, of Navajos not having access to running water and not having access to electricity? And why were one set of grandparents living without running water and near uranium mines, but another set of grandparents um, had a reality very different than that? In the arts, it was a really big deal for me because I remember I would go and visit the Art Institute or the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. I actually ended up going to the School of the Art Institute. And so that was something where I would see, you know, these white male impressionist artists hung 
And there would always be these really important credits like Cezanne created in whatever year, you know, his biography, we're going to talk about all of these things, the portrayal of women, blah, 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 blah. And then I'd go down a few wings further and it would be um, arts of the Americas. And it would talk about indigenous people and native Americans. And there's nothing close to what they had for these other artists in the impressionist wing. It might say something like, artist unknown, or this basket was woven between um, 1800 and 1900. You know, it was not specific at all. There wasn't credit that was going to these artists. And also a lot of times there was very dated language that was used, especially for their tribes. Um, and I think it was something where I started to question as well, like, why are we placing importance on one group of artists? but we're not placing that same importance on another group of artists. And I think this is a conversation that many of us in the arts world have, you know, the differences between what is considered craft and what is considered fine art. And it was like, why are people back home on the res making these beautiful pieces of artwork um, and they're just being called crafts and they're being sold for like 1% of what these other pieces are. So it really started the way that I started to think about art from a very young age. And I knew that that was something that I wanted to change. Um, as I got older, you know, I had a pretty big influential moment. I moved to Argentina for about five years and I lived in Buenos Aires. I also lived in the north of Argentina where they have one of the only indigenous populations in a very white European country. Um, and that really influenced me because I started thinking about human rights and what was going on during the last dictatorship. Um, and how indigenous peoples were treated there and missing and murdered and disappeared folks and what social justice movements were happening as well as the arts. Um, so I actually came back to the US. I started working in a commercial art world, excuse me, a commercial art gallery. I directed two different galleries over several years and it hit a point where I was like, I remember I was having dinner during Basel week and it was like, I had been thinking a lot more about back home and how I wanted to go back and work more with my people and start working again on these things like the lack of running water and electricity. And so I'll talk about how I transitioned to that, but that's where I'm at now um, is working right now actually on COVID relief projects, but generally we do long-term water access projects. So um, I'm just going to show you a few pieces from one of my first bodies of work um, as an adult, I guess, a little older. So most of my work is exactly about what I talked about, right? Like being from the res, uh, self-identity, um, a big portion of my work is talking about the portrayal of Native women, specifically in American culture. I pull in things like these ridiculous costumes that we've all seen. Uh, Halloween parties um, with names like Pocahontas or Naughty Navajo. Um, and I think like many natives, I pull a lot of humor into my work because we've been able to cope with these very difficult histories um, with the mentality of, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Because it's such a big mentality that I think all of us natives have had to adopt. Um, you know, we've had some pretty horrific traumatic pasts with the federal government and within our own people and lateral oppression and whatnot. And I think, but, you know, a lot of my work does include a lot of humor. And as I was saying, my work is very materials heavy and picking up from things like items that are considered um, stereotypically Indian. So again, talking about the idea of hair and feathers and beads and these sort of dated objects. And again, thinking a lot about costuming um, and having the viewer question exactly what it is they're looking at. Because I think oftentimes Americans specifically, and I say that having lived in the US, you know, I mean, again, I, like I mentioned, I lived abroad, but in the US, I get a lot more questions about Native Americans. And these range from things like, um, I didn't realize natives still existed or do you go to college for free or, you know, um, wow, there are more than like three tribes or my grandmother was a Cherokee princess. So there are a lot of things to laugh about. 
Um, I do want to mention one material specifically, which is here on the left, which I'll talk a lot about afterwards, but the bluebird flower bag. So I just want to sort of um, bring everybody's attention to that. And, you know, apart from these materials that are stereo stereotypically Indian, I'm doing quotation marks, y'all can't see me, um, but also thinking about materials that are very specific to my own reservation. And as I was saying before, um, you know, pulling from things like the mascots of the warriors, which are um, from Tuba City, again, where I'm from, and then also thinking about things that actually are used in native tribes, but are oftentimes sort of pan-indigenous. So you'll see this later in my work, but things like quilling or beading are not traditional to Navajos. I pull a lot of things from nature as well. Um, again, I spend a lot of time on the res and I drive a lot and it gives me a lot of time to just sort of forage things from gas stations and spending a lot of time outdoors and um, just where I work in different government offices in general, which you'll see coming up. So I mentioned that I definitely work mainly in photography and um, sort of using my hands in a different way. And that would include things like sewing or embellishment or creating costumes or installations. But it's really hard for me to just focus on one. Um, you know, I definitely like to step away from the screen. I definitely like to step away from editing. I don't work in a color dark room anymore, but there was definitely a moment that I hit where I was like, I don't have to be in the dark and making these images and talking about representation of my family. Um, but then I always find myself kind of going back to photography. So I definitely vacillate between the two. Um, you know, I had mentioned at the beginning that there was a moment where I wanted to move away from the commercial art world and start working more on the ground doing human rights work. And this, when I started creating the series, was one of those moments as well. Um, I had actually gotten in contact with a group of activists that were doing some work where they were bringing attention to uranium contamination on the reservation and implementing some traditional ideas and I teamed up with them. I won't get into too many details, but it actually didn't end up working out. Um, and it was kind of like this big failure for me and this really weird moment where, again, I mentioned lateral oppression where it was like, I just felt like I didn't belong. And I think a big part of life when working in the worlds that I work in is figuring out what you don't want just as much as what you do. So I had planned this like big trip back home to the res from Chicago where I was working and living. And I was supposed to spend several weeks there um, doing this really long walk with them of hundreds of miles and educating people about uranium. And it just totally didn't work out last minute. And it was really hard for me because it was like I had been preparing for this thing for so long. Um, and I've never actually really shared that story a lot with people. But I, when I was going through these slides, I was thinking about it. And what I did next was start to think again, like, well, what do I want to do? And I want to document what goes on at home and take it from this view of, you know, these are just abject Indians who live on the reservation and talk about what we actually experience as a people and as a unique culture, because reservation culture is very unique. Um, and it's really beautiful. And I don't like myself or my people to be portrayed as just shoved onto land. I mean, these are very important discussions to have but it's something that we should also be able to tell our own stories. So around this time, um, you know, documenting res life over this whole summer and doing a lot of research about what was going on back home, I uh, started working with my aunt who was kind of in the field, like collecting water samples. And it was definitely like a preview to what was going to come next, like the following year. Um, and I started noticing art across the res that was made by different artists that were sort of doing the same thing. Like they were working in water and in activism and in community organizing. Um, again, I mentioned the bluebird, you can see that here on the left, but this is an artist whose name is Chip Thomas and he's done a lot of work across the reservation. Uh, he is non-native 
Um, he is a black artist from the South, but he's also an Indian health service doctor who has been doing work on the res for decades. Um, he is actually an OBGYN, but he also does work with cancer patients who have, um, you know, gotten sick from uranium in our water, in our soil, and in our air, which is really what sparked me to start wanting to do more of this. And there's actually sort of a full circle with Chip, which I'll talk about because at this time I was just learning about his work and the, photo the photography that he was doing. And we actually became really good friends later. And he helped me come up with um, some of the pieces, not necessarily the concept, but how to execute them later. And I'll show you that work. So again, you know, sort of stepped back from the camera and said, I want to do things where I'm working with my hands. Um, I think self-care is such an important thing and sort of stepping away from these really arduous issues sometimes and just saying, I want to just make things and I want to be able to just sit here and have like the office or whatever show I was watching at that time in the background and to sew and to just really immerse myself into this work. And so I was very specifically working with these flower bags um, what these are, are they come in like five pound to 50 pound increments and they are cloth cotton bags and they are filled with flour that's used for bread or for cooking. Um, and it's said to make the best piece of fry bread or the best piece of tortilla. But I think the reason why a lot of us Navajos use it is because we get to have this free material afterwards. Um, and, you know, there's also the symbolism of the bluebird or the doli, which is also something that is a big part of our creation story. Growing up, I had seen a lot of the bluebird around, you know, it was used for things like dresses or making bags to carry or store food. Um, and then now that I'm older, I see people do things like making umbrellas out of them or really beautiful bags. And I definitely wanted to start incorporating this and sort of, again, putting this humor into it. Um, this is called the breast implants. I became very obsessed with this material. Um, and it was something where I worked on for a while and I still do now. Uh, and I always find myself coming back to it for sure. But again, it's just such a big part of my childhood. And I think who we are as Navajo women, we're constantly working with this material. And again, as I mentioned with the materials, like a mix of sort of this pan Indian or stereotypical Indian pan indigenous um, group of items. I order a lot of hair from online. Um, I think this is something that is constantly lying around our house that's having to be vacuumed up, but it's one of my favorite materials to work with. And you'll see it throughout a lot of my artwork. So I mentioned this, again, huge shift in my life where I wanted to move away from um, the commercial art world and start working back home, you know, having this sort of constant back and forth between living in a city and going back home to the reservation. And in 2015, I read an article about um, the human rights organization Dig Deep Water, and they were starting out a project on the Navajo Nation, again, to help the one in three Navajos who live there who don't have access to running water. And a huge percentage of those Navajos don't have access to electricity. And as we're seeing during COVID, um, you know, most people on the res have very difficult times when it comes to connectivity, either with internet or with cell phone service. And so um, read about Dig Deep, you know, just kind of hit them up in an email and was like, hey, I'm from the res, you know, I can help. I'm familiar with the water background. Um, you know, to this day, a lot of my family doesn't have running water, but it had been my grandparents that I had definitely grown up with who didn't have running water or electricity. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, I had really seen the effects of what it's like when you don't have that. And not just relating back to being in Chicago and on the res, even just being 30 miles away from where my grandparents were in Tuba City and having that extreme luxury and then going to stay with them on the weekends and, um, just seeing the big differences there and, and what it means when you have running water. Because I think 
oftentimes people think, well, you, it's just, you can't wash your hands or you don't have safe drinking water. It's a lot more than that. It's a mental thing as well. It wears you down and huge finances go into it. And so I definitely love showing this video, which is a project that we did. Um, we teamed up with a group of plumbers and electricians and pipe fitters, and they're called I Wish. I always give them a shout out. The International Water Sanitation and Hygiene Foundation. Um, and they came to the reservation. They've been there twice now, excuse me, three times now to team up with us to do running water projects. But this one was very special because we were working in a very remote part of the res where we still work called Navajo Mountain or Natsitsan. And it's a unique community because it's split between the states of Arizona and Utah. It's in three different counties and they deal with both the tribal and federal government when it comes to funding for these projects. And so, you know, we're not just looking at the Navajo Nation as a sovereign nation, we're having to look at it in states and that becomes very difficult you might have a family that lives literally 10 feet away from the state line and they won't get the same services as someone who lives on the other side because there's just not enough funding. This area is one of the most rural on the Navajo Nation. And it is said that when the federal government was rounding us up for the long walk in the 1800s, that many family members were able to stay here and hide out because of how rural the area was and because Kit Carson and um, the army weren't a lot, weren't able to actually find these people. And so a big part of my job, which Betsy talked about before, um, you know, is protecting our elders and is making sure that we're able to ensure that our elders can stay at home. And oftentimes when they don't have things like running water or a flush toilet, they have to leave um, because they need that when they get older. And so this is Emma Seaton here, and she was 93 when this video was taken. This was in the summer of 2019. And teaming up with this great organization, not only were we able to install running water, but we were able to install a toilet. And here's a video of her turning on water for the very first time. Yes. So, you know, I've described myself as an activist and I definitely am that I'll say working for a 501c3 like dig deep and running the Navajo water project has its challenges. Um, I do definitely need to keep both very separate, but there are times where they do intersect and it's amazing. For example, I got to go to Standing Rock twice and it was the like literally the most life-changing experience for me. And it was amazing to see what could happen when native peoples and our allies came in to one area and came in huge numbers and said, you know, we're not going to let this happen. And we're here to look out for one another and to protect each other and to protect our most precious resource or water. Um, it was so beautiful. I think, you know, I say this all the time, but not a day goes by that I don't think about my time at Standing Rock. And it's very emotional for me when I talk about Standing Rock because it's just something that I wish that could happen every single day that we could have a group where we come together and we do things like talk about our individual cultures and our individual tribes, but we also celebrate what it's like to be one big group of indigenous peoples. And again, our allies who are there to help. So um, I was there in the summer and the winter, right when the camp got shut down and I was uh, staying there beyond that time. And um, it was just, really incredible to see how things were still moving, you know, months and honestly years later. Um, and so that really started to kind of turn the wheels in my mind and think about how I wanted the space that wasn't just so um, ephemeral and it was going to be broken up and how we needed a physical location for natives to gather and to celebrate who we are, were again of, as individual groups, but also as one big group together. Um, so, you know, being at Standing Rock, I started to learn a, lo a lot more about treaties. And I always grew up knowing what our treaties were or our treaty from 1868, our last treaty between the Navajo Nation and the federal government. 
but I honestly didn't know that much about other treaties outside of my own tribe. And um, I wanted to share this here. So this is actually a portion of our treaty from 1868. I left the old spelling because I think that's kind of funny, like just such an old school thing. Um, but I became very interested in what our treaty actually said. And also this idea of the fact that these were written in English and they were handed to people who didn't speak English, who had to have this interpreted for them and couldn't write or sign their names. And so, you know, we were making these huge changes and these huge compromises and being forced to do it um, just by signing away these things with an X mark. So here on the left, you can see this is actually what the treaty looks like from 1868 on this ledger paper. And you'll see at the top, these are the federal government representatives and they're able to sign and write their name, um, names. And then at the bottom, these are all of our chiefs or our leaders who just literally put that X there. I'm always really fascinated by our treaty specifically as well because the Diné are a matrilineal culture. And when this treaty was being signed, um, men had oftentimes never been in this position of power who were Navajo to say, we're going to make these decisions. And so there used to be runners when they were going through these things and there was explanation because women weren't allowed. And so these runners would run back to the women and explain what was going on. And they would say, you know, this is not okay, or yes, we have to do this. And um, it really just shows again, like the federal government came in and totally altered things for us. And we still do respect women and women still are seen as the leaders, but it was a huge moment that shifted who we were as people. Um, so I'm just gonna leave this up here for a second if you wanna go ahead and read things that are in here. So I actually saw this treaty in person when it traveled back to the Navajo Nation from the Smithsonian um, several years ago. And it, it was really emotional to see because there were things here like saying, you have to send your kids to school and they have to learn English and they're not going to learn Navajo. And, um, you know, it's just something that has always affected us who we are. This is a portion of the treaties, um, one of the treaties in California. It's called the Treaty with the Collis, Willes, et cetera, and it was signed in 1851. And as I mentioned, I really didn't know that much about other treaties from other groups until I was at Standing Rock and I started to read the treaty with the Lakota and um, different tribes around there. And, you know, again, I occupy Tongva land and I'm here in Los Angeles. And I started to learn about what are called the 18 Moss Treaties. For those of you who don't know, I definitely encourage you to Google this afterwards and look it up, but essentially the 18 lost treaties are a set of treaties that were signed between tens of tribes, not just 18 groups, but tens of tribes. Oftentimes the federal government would group, you know, a lot of different tribes together and they'd sign the treaties with them and they would make these promises like, you know, you're going to give us um, the land division isn't here, but you're going to give us these rivers and you're going to stay on this land. And in exchange, we'll give you things like shirts or needles or thimbles. Um, and these treaties were never ratified. They were signed in the mid 1800s and they were found in the 1930s, literally locked away in a Senate desk. And at this time, the federal government had taken what they wanted, but they didn't deliver reservations or, you know, these items that are quote unquote here to help people get a civilized life. And it was really maddening to learn about that um, because it's not something that's spoken about widely. So I started thinking about this and speaking with friends who are natives from California and thinking about my own treaty and seeing the differences between what it's like when you have a treaty that you're able to point to and say, this is our reservation. These are the lands that were promised, we're a sovereign nation, you know, then have friends who are talking about how they don't have these things that came from the government and how the government still to this day has not honored those treaties, despite the fact that they were signed like the other treaty that you just saw between leaders and the federal government. So getting back to the idea of materials, I started to pull a lot of materials that were actually listed in these treaties. Like here, this piece is called 500 needles. And as you saw in the previous slide, um, 
there were 500 needles that were promised for land. And again, like incorporating things, I keep saying this, but like the pan indigenous items and the stereotypical, you know, Indian items and also materials from my own reservation. And so I said, you know, I work a lot in, um, uh, government offices, or I have to visit places where we have these sort of like pamphlets across the res that talk about uranium and radon. Um, and I just, I definitely am like a pack rat. I obsessively collect materials. I'm actually looking over my table right now at like a pile of things and I hold on to these and then I kind of, you know, do research and figure out what I want to then make for these things, these different pieces. So here's um, sort of a detail shot But being on the road, it's always really nice for me to carry these things and just sort of take a break from my work because my work can be very emotional. Being with communities that don't have, you know, basic human rights. Um, and it's nice for me at night to just honestly sit there and sew. It really helps me. And all of these are tablet shapes, so they do reference the 18 treaties. And again, I'm totally obsessed with the X mark um, of what people were signing their names for. And this is actually a trash bag from NGS, which is the Navajo Generating Station, uh, which was one of the last coal fired plants in the United States. And it took a lot of our water on the reservation and it made a lot of people sick and it made us dependent on the money that was produced from this. And when the coal mine shut down, all of a sudden we didn't have this. And it was really difficult to figure out how to move forward next. Um, but this piece is titled 5,712 and you saw that in the lecture name as well. And 5,712 references the data that was released in 2016 um, or from 2016, that that's the amount of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls that were reported. And, you know, that number is actually a lot higher because data collection is such a huge issue when it comes to Native peoples and Native women specifically because we're oftentimes grouped in other ethnicities um, or else people will report someone who's missing or who has been murdered and, you know, they don't, the, the police or whichever agency doesn't report it as that. You know, we hear these accounts from people saying, well, I was turned away from the police station and I was told that my mom was a drunk, so they weren't going to take her missing person report. Um, so there are 5,712 quills on here. But when I was researching these treaties, I really just started to think about like land division and what land division means when it comes to Native women's bodies. And where's the jurisdiction of laws, you know, on and off our reservation and if you're non-native and you commit a crime on a reservation, um, you know, like a sexual abuse or a murder, you can't be tried because our tribal police can't find you and they can't bring you to justice or to court. And so it was something that is always in the back of my mind, especially as someone who always had to visit a border town to get things like groceries or go for different services and then come back home on the res and think about the fact that people can just cross these reservation borders. Um, but again, who are the people that set up these borders and what do they actually mean? So this piece is actually talking just about that. I mentioned that I work a lot with hair and how that references native women and sort of the stereotype. Um, but this was a show that I had in Chicago a couple years ago, and I lined the gallery with this hair. Um, and it is to reference, you know, missing and murdered indigenous women. And my partner helped me meticulously glue all this different hair into these cracks into the gallery. Um, it's sort of something dark to think about, but you know, when we talk about people who are found, one of the first things that they mention is their hair, like if it's in land or if they find a body. I'm gonna show you a video here on the left. So 
So this piece was paired along with some of the treaty works and I started to think about what it was like as a native woman displaying these works and educating people in a white cube space. And I wanted to take it a step further and sort of open the space to have more of a community organizing event and bring us together. Um, because again, I was really thinking back to like Standing Rock and these other amazing opportunities that I had when I was able to come together with large groups and have things happen. And so at the gallery, we organized um, this Navajo taco dinner. And we had these things here in the middle, which are called Piccadillies, which are a snow cone that has the snow cone syrup. But in addition to it, it has sliced pickles that have been soaked in Kool-Aid and then gummy bears that have been soaked in Kool-Aid. Um, and again, sort of this like humorous moment, like thinking about inserting this into this white cube space. And it was something that made me really happy because, you know, a lot of my friends who are non-native or who weren't from the reservation were sort of like, this is disgusting. I don't get this. This is definitely like a res delicacy. Um, not everyone likes it, but, you know, some of us do. And I think it was really important to me to sort of have people laugh at that, like if they saw it on social media or if they came to the exhibition themselves or if they were at that event. It made me really happy because people often ask me, well, you know, a lot of people don't understand these pieces, specific pieces, because they're talking about res life. And again, it's a very unique culture, but that doesn't matter to me because I want to be able to create work for my people um, who get that humor, or who understand it and have those explanations available to people. So I started uh, going back to photo again, jumping back. And um, I started this series uh, also called 5,712. And I was approached by um, my community leaders back home from Tuba City uh, who organized a yearly event, which is called the Western Navajo Fair. And they wanted to talk about missing and murdered indigenous women. And they asked me if I would do a piece and I didn't really know what to do. You know, it's a family event. I didn't want to make it like super jarring with hair installations or something where it was still culturally respective of Navajos um, because hair can be something that's really taboo in our culture. And so I started to think about working again with the community and talking with women about their stories when it came to sexual violence or to people who might've been missing or murdered in their family and not exploiting them, but actually having these conversations where as someone myself being a native woman, talking about my experiences as well. And so my main goal was to really put a name to data or put um, a name to the problem and talk about the fact that these are our sisters, like this here in the photo literally is my sister and my little niece um, and our mothers and our grandmothers and our aunts. And it's not something where we're just 5,712, we're actual people. And when they go missing from our community, we're losing a big part of who we are. So here you can kind of see these installed um, uh, in C2. And the feedback that I got was really great. I mean, it was very emotional to have these conversations with people and people were really open to talking about things. I took tens of portraits. I think there were probably like 30, maybe closer to 40 altogether. And I sort of set up this makeshift studio at my dad's house and um, people would come and, you know, we'd sit and we'd have like, uh, you know, a drink and, um, you know, some soda or snacks and just talk about these things. And again, always in the back of my mind that I wanted to have a physical location where we could come to these places. And it was something where it was year round and it wasn't just this like my dad's garage, you know. So this, all of this leads us to the chapter house, which I founded, um, we became a 501c3 in March of 2020. It's been almost a year. Um, and, you know, the way that we describe ourselves is we are an indigenous state, an indigenous space, but everyone is welcome. And I think in addition to having a space where we can come together as Native peoples, it's really important to me that we also have um, the opportunities to educate those, again, who are non-Native. And, um, you know, we are technically located in Los Angeles, being here myself, but right now we're all online. Uh, everything's digital. 
And it's really important to us that we engage people who are from the reservation or who are from different native nations. And again, really thinking about the fact that it's important to honor our individual tribes, but also talk about who we are as people collectively, as indigenous people, not just here on Turtle Island or in North America, but from across the world. Um, and if you want to know why we're called the chapter house, here's a definition, but essentially the Navajo Nation is split up into 110 different chapters and there's a local government there and they have what's called a chapter house and people come together to gather to do different community events here. Um, the local government meets, but it's just a place where people can come and be together and so I really drew inspiration from that and then thinking about things again like museums and galleries and other institutions and you know how I want it to be more than just we come together for marches or for rallies or for protests but we're able to have a place for native empowerment and have programming around that and bring programming to people who might not always have that opportunity again not everybody gets to have one foot in Chicago in the museum world and one foot on the res and so Eventually, you know, by the end of the year, our hopes are to have fundraised enough money um, to have a physical location, both here in Los Angeles, but on the reservation as well, back in Tuba City. Um, because I know all too well, like a lot of the reasons why we have problems that are on the Navajo Nation, like high teen pregnancy and alcohol, is because there's not a lot of things to do. And I want to create those um, opportunities, you know, if it's something like a movie screening or yoga or a weaving circle or language classes, it's really important to me. So um, this is just the last thing that I'm going to talk about here. I want to share just a few things that the chapter house has done in the past year. Um, so most of us who do this, although I'm the founder, I have amazing support. And most of us who work on this are Native women ourselves. And um, we're from all different tribes. And then we also have some really amazing allies. I definitely want to give like a huge shout out to Katie, who I know is on this call. Um, but she's been such a great collaborator. And I work with her on the Navajo Water Project, but also on the chapter house. And it's been really amazing because we just have these conversations where we help each other guide what we want to do next in terms of our programming and the messaging we want to have around it. Um, and I definitely, it would be bad if I didn't mention Cindy Sherman, my dog here, who helps us out a lot with, uh, you know, I won't say paperwork or filing, but the emotional support. Um, but again, it's not just me who does this project, it's a lot of us and it takes a lot of work and I'll say it is really difficult having an art practice, um, directing the Navajo Water Project and making this happen. But we really are still just like building our community and I'll leave you with our information here at the end because we have some, really great programs that have been upcoming, excuse me, that are upcoming. Um, and I wanna just share two clips to end here with you. So our first online event that we had was Indigeneity in the 21st century. And we had six different natives from um, all across the US. And, you know, some of them um, have mixed identities. Some of them are from what we would call like opposing tribes, you know, either, um, excuse me, the Crow or the Lakota and tribes that traditionally didn't get along. And it was amazing. Like the feedback we got afterwards, we had a really high attendance and I was so proud. And the feedback we got afterwards was like, oh my God, these are conversations that I've wanted to have and I've never been able to have these. And I don't wanna say that these spaces don't exist, but I want to add to these spaces and make sure that this is a much bigger project and that it's long-term and it's not just a pop-up space. Um, but I'm going to share with you here a clip of what was said by Janae Collins, who is Lakota, Dakota, and Crow. Um, and she talked about sort of growing up in those worlds again to kind of circle back to what I had talked about. Um, so here we go. Like the opposing part in me kind of just rested and just like accepted, you know, like this is who I am. Like, this is like, this was one of my proudest moments. It's just so cool, like being here in my elk tooth dress. And that was one of the first times in my my life as a Lakota, Dakota, a Psalica woman that I actually felt really proud of being Crow. And um, I think that's kind of a, a cool thing for somebody that grew up primarily 
only knowing their Lakota, Dakota side. It's something that brings peace. And because I internalized it as a child, I had to work it out in, in my adolescent life. And it has brought so much peace to me as who I am, like for my identity, for like the clashing identities, so to speak. Oh, this is my dad here, if y'all want to let him in. Um, so I'm actually, I am closing here with something that I worked on with my dad and my sister on the chapter house. And it's our newest segment called Give an Elder a Mic with the chapter house. And it's something where we have interviews. This is our very first one. It came out two weeks ago. But it's something where we have interviews um, with our elders from different nations and from um different tribes and we talk about you know what it was like growing up where they grew up and to just sort of collect their knowledge um, because you know one of the hardest parts of COVID has been that we've lost so many elders on Native nations and it's losing information and it's losing our traditions and our cultures that we'll never get back you know these are libraries of information that are gone forever and one of the silver linings of COVID has been that a lot of elders have learned to use technology and Zoom and they're able to have these recordings. And so we really wanna tap into that and say, let's actually collect this information so that we have it for later. Um, and, you know, kind of just like having their um, humor as well that goes into it and give an elder a mic is sort of humorous as well because my sisters and my friends and I you know we always grew up listening to our elders and I think a lot of us natives thought oh my gosh or a lot of cultures think like here we go again another elder like you know we joke like you give an elder a mic and it's like dot 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 and then you know years later they're still talking I have really changed how I think as I've gotten older because it's something that I know that that's so important to give them that opportunity and we have this amazing technology and we have internet and it's time to just collect these stories. So I'll share this. And then again, I'll leave you with our information so that you can watch this full interview and take a look at a lot of the other things that we're doing and we have coming up. This is the way we lived. Um, so uh, it was, I didn't know any better, I guess, but um, so anyway, um, and then, you know, it went to school, you know, we're, um, we were required, my parents were required to put us in school. And I went to preschool out here and I went to the boarding school in Tuba City uh, for, uh, from the, you know, what they, at that time they used to call it, they didn't call it kindergarten, they used to call it beginner, you know. Uh, it was like, I was six years old when they put me in there. And, and I remember going there and getting dropped, get, being dropped off for school. And I remember, you know, in this, being in this strange place, you know, um, the building actually, you know, and, and all the kids are crying because, you know, they're, they're missing their moms and their dads and, and some for the many is probably the first time they, um, left, you know, their parents and it's the same as with me, but I don't remember, uh, crying or I don't remember, you know, uh, but I remember kind of being a little scared. I remember being, um, sad because, you know, I, I knew my, you know, just dropped off with strangers and things like that. that so that was my first experience uh, with being away from home and and having to be um, sent away to school. So if you want to hear that full interview and see everything else that we're doing, you can uh, take a look at our website here, thechapterhouse.org. Um, like I said, everything we're doing right now is online to be safe and keep our safe, ourselves safe and our community members safe during COVID. Um, and I'll leave you our email address too, because what we're doing, as I said, is building this community. And, you know, we had a Metis um, weaving night and we have a concert coming up and another um, community arts event where everyone comes and talks about what they're working on in terms of art. And so if there's something that you want to submit or that you would like to see us do, please email us or you can DM us on the gram. And then here is my information at the top and my Instagram as well. Um, I'm pretty horrible with like all other social media. So feel free to follow me there, but this is what I do the most. So thank you. Emma, thank you so much for um, for being here with us today and for for bearing with us as we experienced what is certainly my first 
um, experience with uh, Zoom bombing, very jarring experience. And thanks to all of you who, who logged back on with the new link. We very much appreciate you, uh, you sticking around and hearing about this really important work that Emma is doing in the um, activist and, and arts realm. Emma, we have already taken up far more time than we intended to with you. Do you have time for a few questions? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, anything that I can do to procrastinate to um, get out of packing and moving. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, we will. Fantastic. We'll help yeah. you with that procrastination then. Um, I am going to go into the little security feature. Uh, everyone should be able to put a question in the chat right now. And I am also going to select so that you have the option to unmute yourselves um, and start your video if you would like to, um, you know, have, have everyone be able to put a face to a name. And as those questions start to trickle in, people are, people are thinking, typing perhaps, um, let me just kick things off by saying, you know, you, you in, in the art that you, you showed us, particularly in the beginning of this presentation, um, you've, you've made these pieces that are, you're about the ways Native women have been very stereotyped, um, particularly in, in mainstream um, US culture. Um, and you've, you've made these really nuanced pieces about the epidemic of murdered, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. And, and these works do strike me as deeply feminist. Um, and I'm wondering if you then characterize your work, your activist work with the Navajo Water Project and uh, with Chapter House. Do you see that as a part of your feminism as well? Could you speak to that a little bit? Of course, uh, that's a great question. You know, when you had introed me, you had said Emma loves empowering Indigenous women. And it's not just like empowering, it's not like a place where I hold that knowledge or I hold that ability to do that for people. But it's a process where we come together and make things happen. You know, I work with so many amazing people of all genders, of all gender identification on the Navajo Water Project. But I love working specifically with Native women who are there because you know, traditionally, as I mentioned when talking about the treaties, we've been the leaders of our communities and we're the caregivers of our communities. And we've seen that even more during COVID because we've had to step up and say, I'm going to do this. It's not the idea of the 1960s, stay in the kitchen, take care of your family. You don't have a place anywhere else. It's the idea of I have this privilege, I have this platform, and I have this knowledge to be able to take care of my own community, whether that's bringing water to somebody or making sure that people are getting supplies during COVID. You know, we've had the highest infection rates months and months again on the Navajo Nation. Um, now we're getting a lot of vaccinations, people are getting emergency supplies that they need, and a lot of it has to do with women, you know, and I think for me, I always want to make sure that we're including Dine women in these projects because it can very quickly become the sort of otherization and the saviorism complex and it becomes very quickly male dominant. And um, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen because that's not who we are as Native people or as Navajo people. Um, and that's not who I am. And again, it's not to say that people of other genders or gender identification don't have a place to help, but it's important to me that we continue that. In terms of the chapter house, the exact same thing. You know, I want to make sure that we're also including a lot more women or people who identify as women or females in these arts because far often men get a lot more attention. And I'm tired of that. Like, you know, even in 2021, we're still seeing that there's more money that goes to male artists, no matter what um, ethnicity they are, than women. And I just feel like I'm not a quiet person. I have the platform and again, the privilege to be able to stand up and make sure that that happens. And I want to, I want to do just that. Great. Thank you so much. And I'll ask you as well. Um, I think this is a, a tricky question and one that many of us grapple with, you know, activist organizations, including the ones that you were involved with, they really, they need funding, you know, at their base, the activist organizations, they need money. Um, but there are so many folks, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the context of the art world, who, who just don't have a lot of extra money to give. Um, so what then would you say is the best way for those who really want to contribute, but perhaps cannot do that financially? What is the best way for them to contribute to these causes? I think sharing information is so valuable and, you know, I definitely understand like the financial side of it. And 
it's not always about money. I think the nonprofit world can be really icky when it comes to funding. You know, again, having um, a background in the commercial art world and then having now working in the nonprofit field, it's like people ask me all the time, well, what's the difference between the two? And it's like, it's just a different type of money and a different type of way of funding it. You know, nonprofits are like the NFL and these like, you know, the Catholic church, they're like these huge organizations. It's not like everybody out there is like in the struggle, you know, doing doing the work or doing the good work. So I think with that said, the more you can spread about these issues is really important. And everybody has a place in the fight. If your fight is giving money, great. But if your fight is sharing articles or even doing the simple things like we talked about, like knowing whose land you're occupying and researching the treaty of that area that you're on, that's really important. And it's important because you learn about something and you share it, you know, you repost something, you'd be surprised at how many people that's going to affect. You don't need to be a crazy influencer with 20 million followers. You can be someone who's just saying to your mom or your dad or your partner, or whatever, like, hey, I read about this and you might be interested in it. Or this is what um, this organization is doing and making sure that you also indigenize your feed, right? So like, just start getting into that rabbit hole or that habit of every day reading something about native peoples or indigenous peoples or whatever you're interested in. It doesn't only need to be um, native issues. And also talking about the victories that are happening because it's important for people to know that those exist as well. Um, and I'd say, you know, for people who wanna help too, like making sure that you're creating space for the people in these areas to speak and for their voices and elevating them so that it's like, you're not making these issues about yourself necessarily, but also just using your place to help out when you can too. Um, and I'd say, if you wanna help the chapter house specifically, again, reach out to us and let us know, do you wanna teach a class online? Like, do you want to do something? You don't have to be native to participate. Again, it's for everybody. and. Our programming doesn't just have to be about natives, you know, whatever your background is, we want to hear it. Um, but I think it's just so important to educate yourself so that way you can teach others as well. Great, thank you. And Abby, I think I may turn things over to you to perhaps see if there are questions from others. Well, we have a, a quiet crowd, but um, a lot of just shared appreciation, um, gratitude. Um, of, I, I'll read out some of them, if that's all right, Yael and, and Kristen, just thank yous. Um, it was a fascinating presentation. I'm going to look into the links you shared with us. This is from my Yael. Really glad to attend and really appreciate the way you handled the Zoom bombing. Big thanks. Um, again, thanks from everyone, which I'll echo. Um, but no, no questions coming in for now, which um, I think I kind of, I love the, Betsy, unless you have another question you'd like to ask Emma or. Sure, I'll, um, I'll give those of you, if anyone wants to raise their hand, you are of course welcome to do that and ask in person. I'll give those who might want a chance to vocalize a question here a moment. And if not, um, that's okay too, I think. We're all a little shaken from this afternoon, understandably. Um, so I think I may just close out with a final question for you, Emma. You've mentioned some of the phenomenal women that it sounds like you are working with in, in many different sort of aspects in your life with the, the many hats that you wear in your life. Um, are there other women in, in your life that you would like to mention now who've been particularly inspirational for you? Um, and I'm thinking in terms of your art, your activism, your personal life, very, very broadly speaking? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think I have three sisters and I'm very close, um, I mean, admittedly to two of them. And definitely, you know, you saw one of my sisters in the interview. She is almost 10 years younger than I am, but she's definitely a huge source of inspiration. Um, and I feel really great when I work with her because we come from very different backgrounds. She's very academia heavy, like really, really heavy. I tease her a lot about it because I'm like, oh, I got my BFA. It took me like eight years. Um, but she's somebody that I draw a lot of inspo from and someone who pushes me to learn about new things and do new things. 
Um, and then my other sister, Natalia, who works back home on the reservation and who's actually, um, I don't know if she's still on this call, but she was earlier. And she's someone who's there helping people and making sure that they get what they need. She helps people get um, what are called home site leases so that they can get things like running water or that they can build on their land. Um, in terms of native artists who I draw a lot of inspiration from, I'd say literally probably every artist in the native feminism show, um, especially Natani Nota, her work is amazing. And she's someone who actually just curated my work into a show. And that was the first time that I had ever worked with her, but she's someone who's touching on some like amazing issues. Um, and of course, Marie Watt, love her as well. And, you know, I think also, um, Katie, who I mentioned too, who's also on this call, who just has stepped up as an ally and a, an accomplice and does all this work for the chapter house. And um, it's just been really inspiring to see. And I think, you know, the last person I'll mention is um, my grandmother, who definitely taught me a lot about these different values and who taught me about art growing up and just saying like, you know, when you come from a place of privilege or when you have this platform, you need to use your voice. Um, and I'd say just like every woman who's out there during COVID right now, you know, 80% of medical workers are women and everyone who's just stepping up and saying like, I have to take care of my community right now. Um, that's a big source of inspiration for me as well.